<laughs> so I'd now like to introduce you to our finance panel, and it's consisting of Peter Jaco, who is a serial investor, an entrepreneur, and innovation accelerator, and he has worked very closely recently with Innovate UK, formerly the Technology Strategy Board. Simon Bond, on the end there, Director of the University of Bath Innovation Centre, Innovation Director at Set Squared Partnership. Peter Claydon, Continuum Bridge CEO, also ex-CEO of Pico Bridge. Um, Continuum Bridge is a recent startup, still in the throes of raising finance, so there's obviously some interesting insight from that side of things. And of course, Chris Dyson, in the middle here, who will be the chair for this finance panel. He is a partner at Ashford's LLP, who advises to a range of tech clients, including startups, spin-outs, established companies, and investment funds. But before we open up the floor to Q&A, each panel member will provide some further background information regarding themselves and the area of financial activities that they operate within, starting with Peter Jaco, please. Do I start on the other end? Do you want to throw Do you want to go first? I thought I was going to go last. Do you want to go last? <laughs> thanks, Peter. <laughs> no uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, so, what should we do? Ten minutes. Um, I started work for the University of Bath to run their innovation centre back in 2003, and the University of Bath Innovation Centre is confusingly the, um, the Set Squared Centre uh, as well. Um, and I, I violently agree with everything that Ewan said, uh, very, very, uh, very, very useful, particularly for this panel session. So I was, I was just um, remembering the past, like the olden days. So back in if I started in September 2003, I guess it was 2004, we had a company come into the Set Squared Centre at the time in Swindon. Uh, it's run by this Indian guy, Shashank Garg, I remember very well. And he was designing a water meter, which had a SIM card in it. He was designing a water meter. That was the, the idea. It was sort of pre-internet of things, but definitely a machine-to-machine -machine, uh, solution. And the proposition that he was uh, touting around the water utility companies was that uh, with his SIM card, putting data, uh, uh, sending sending the data, they could uh, reduce their, their uh, bad volumes of water inspectors and people going around and it would save them lots of money and he got absolutely nowhere. He worked it very, very hard. I bumped into Shashank a few years ago, a couple of years ago, and he's designing apps now and being much more successful. But it didn't work. He did, I think, sell, license the design to a few places in the Middle East where there was new build going on and um, I guess water was, was more valuable. So, so there are some thoughts about that, that company and why it didn't work at that time. First of all, um, I guess it was a, a pretty tight marketplace. Um, I'm not sure you're allowed to call the water utility industry a monopoly, but it's near as damn it, isn't it? Not many players. Any innovation that goes on there is kind of driven by regulation and resisted violently. Um, and saving labor costs on poorly paid water inspectors on, at the time, a, a, a you know, water commodity that wasn't that expensive, really wasn't a big a big deal. Fast forward um, to uh, another company that I was talking to uh, early 2014, so 10 years later, a uh, member of Set Squared. Um, actually, I better let's, let's give them their name. So this is Mike Baker with Russell Hagar, Exilon. Um, definitely decided they, they, they call themselves a machine-to-machine -machine Internet of Things company. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a chip, it's a sensor. Uh, destined for the three-point plugs that will be going uh, at the end of devices and uh, the, the, the data on, on the power, uti power usage of washing machines, cookers and so forth will go to a, a home hub and that will inform the, uh, the user on, on how they're using their power and how they could use it better. Well, they, had a, they had a pretty hard time getting, getting, getting funding but um, they had the breakthrough at the beginning um, of the year and I, you know, they, they did raise um, quite a decent seven-figure sum. Around half of it coming from Department for Energy and Climate Change in the form of a grant that leveraged some angel money. So they, they, they've done well that, and I, you know, I believe the business uh, is, is, is doing well um, since. Speaking to them, a couple of things um, had happened um, where they previously had been describing themselves as a smart meter company, and that market hadn't moved very well in those, in those sort of... Um, late 2009s, 10s, just didn't, didn't really happen like we had hoped it to have happened. Then of course Google with Nest, Internet of Things, and that just unlocked the market for them, and that allowed them to, to, um, to get some, some finance. So I guess the, the sort of the set squared, the, the 10, 10 year view is not very helpful, but you've just got to 
be in the right place at the right time, and particularly for what we do, and it's very consistent with this, is financing your Internet of Things idea rather than you know, funding more established businesses. That, that first entrepreneurial step, um, leveraging the right, being, the, being in the right place at the right time to get some government money, debt money, TSB money, and so forth, and to get the private money in there behind it. So yeah, that's, that's been our, a couple of experiences that we've had on Internet of Things. Ah, oh, that was sudden. Um, <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so it's financing your Internet of Things idea and um, what qualifies me to um, sit here and uh, talk about that. Um, well, I co-founded a company in Bath back in 2000 called PicoChip, um, and that was actually before the um, set squared was set up in Bath. In fact, I can remember discovering that the University of Bath had acquired Carpenter House and they were going to put some sort of facility in there where you could go and be with other startups and have office space and got in contact with the bursar at the university and said, um, you know, what about this? When is it going to be available? Um, as if it was in the next, you know, three to four months that will be useful to us. And he said, oh, no, I think that'll be at least six months, and I think you moved in there about three years later, probably. <laughs> um, no, no, la later, actually, in, into, uh, into Bath, wasn't it? Yes. Um, so there wasn't that sort of stuff around uh, now when you and getting that advice, and generally speaking, what you did was, uh, if you knew other people who were in startup companies who'd raised money, you went and chatted to them, and um, you could uh, you know, find out what they did, get introductions to their investors, which is, uh, is what we actually did. Um, that company, Pikachu, was in the um, was in the semiconductor area, and that industry has gone through a, an interesting change. Um, we were, I guess, completely naive, which was a, a big advantage, and we just went out and raised. Um, uh, well, we said we needed six million dollars um, to start with, and we raised seven, um, and it didn't seem uh, it didn't seem that difficult at the time. Um, it was in some ways, but it was about six months. Um, every subsequent round of funding we raised after that was a lot more difficult. Um, so in, in some ways, if you've got nothing and just an idea, um, just a few, a few blokes and with some pedigree, um, it can be quite easy to raise money. I think the um, thing that's probably changed now, and I think that applies to the majority of internet things companies because of the sort of market it is, whether it's at the one end of the scale, as Jürgen was talking about, at the, at the actual sensors, all the way through to the big data processing and making sense of lots of data is, you can actually most likely get something off the ground, build some sort of prototype alpha product, get some customers, and um, then you can go out and get funding. And we've seen it, actually, that's kind of what investors expect. So. The company I'm, I'm now with, Continuum Bridge, um, well, what do we do? Uh, we connect uh, things, and I thought, some, you know, here's a thing. It's a, little, uh, it's a little PIR sensor that senses temperature and other things at the same time, which is great. Um, another thing, this is actually a, a Texas Instruments reference design. It's really great. It's got a coin cell battery. It senses temperature and humidity and atmospheric pressure got an accelerometer and a, and a gyro and magnetometer in it. So lots of stuff, and it communicates through Bluetooth. And the other thing actually um, communicates through what I call Z-Wave. I noticed that you were called Z-Wave. Um, and we then talk to um, a, little, a little hub. We don't design the hardware of this either. It's actually inside. It's a Raspberry Pi inside here at the moment. So um, they all connect to that. And then um, we also have a, a cloud platform that this connects to. And what we basically do is we, we connect things to the internet and we manage them. And then we enable anyone who wants to to actually write applications that use those things. Um, so what we've been able to do, we went out and we've got a, um, what I still call the Technology Strategy Board um, grant, um, in Innovate UK now. Um, and uh, so we, we've got that that's providing some money for development and trials. And we've currently gone and got ourselves um, one paid trial with a commercial customer and, um, and one real customer um, who's you know, wanting to deploy in, um, or is going to deploy with our help in, in 50 locations. So we've got that, and now that's an opportunity for us to go out and say, we've got this stuff, actually we've got engagements with 
all this bunch of other people as well, and we need money to go and do something. And I think that gets me down to the point that I was wanting to make here, is that um, the Internet of Things, raising money for your Internet of Things idea, is no different from raising money from anything else. You've actually got to have, um, you've got to have a business. Um, and just as we were doing you know, back in 2000, and you, you've got to put yourself back in the, in the shoes, in the mind of the person who you want to invest in you. And the most likely thing is, unless it's your, your friends and family and who kind of like you and really believe in you, that um, anyone who invests in you wants to make some money and they want to return. And because they invest in lots of people, um, they'll be looking at getting sort of, you know, maybe a 10 to 20x return on, on what they've invested in you. So if they put in a million pounds, they'll be looking to get out 10 to 20 million pounds in not too many years' time. And they're not greedy. Um, they, want to do, they want to do that because most of the things they invest in actually are going to fail. Uh, it's a risky business investing in small companies. So... Um, so they've got to actually have the chance of making big returns on anything they invest in to make sure they get money back on, on some things. Um, so if you put a business plan together which isn't going to show that happening, then um, it, the chances are you won't get investment. And that, that rules out whole swathes of ideas, which may be a good idea um, for many reasons. It may be a good thing for an established company to do because they can get an acceptable RII on that for their internal purposes. I've just realized I'm looking at a clock up there and um, the hands aren't moving, so the fact that I think I've, I haven't been talking for any time at all <laughs> is, <laughs> is going to help. So I'll, 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 um, I'll, um, I'll wrap up before I, I outstay my welcome. Um, so, um, this, when it, so when it comes down to this, and hopefully we'll get some questions afterwards around these, uh, these things, um, is it's just a, it's just an, it's another business, um, and you need to make sure you're giving away enough of your equity so that um, you know I'm not going to do arithmetic. Well, maybe I'm going to try and do arithmetic in my head. But if you, you know, if you, someone wants to turn their one million, one million pounds into twenty million pounds, and you think your company on exit might be valued at say, um, you know, twice its uh, twice its annual revenue, then um, they're going to have to have a substantial proportion of the equity in your company for that to make sense. So it just comes down to sort of simple, simple arithmetic. And I think there are, the good thing about the Internet of Things is there are so many different opportunities where you can actually see your way through to making substantial returns. Um, things that, you know, are going to grow uh, into big things. And all, all we're doing as a company, fitting into that whole chain of Internet of Things stuff, is connecting things to the Internet. Um, which everyone says to us is, well, not everyone, lots of people say, that's not very clever, you can do that anyway. Um, it only makes sense when you go to a customer and they, they're having really big problems in doing that, um, and you see that that's actually one of the, the difficult things, so that's a good niche to be in, and you can then say, you can, you can project your revenues going forward for you know, five or six years and show you've, got a, you've actually got a business there. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll chip in now then. I'm assuming my mic's on. Thank you. Um, I'm Chris Dyson. I'm a, a partner in the technology group at Ashford. Um, I act for many technology companies, right from startups through to you know, multinationals, and advised um, census on the recent smart meter rollout with the government, which uh, um, puts you in a position where you can analyse one or two of the couple of problems that they're facing on the smart meter rollout. Um, which is, is quite invaluable in the earlier stage of the market in gearing it up. Um, probably the main reason I'm on the finance panel is that for a lot of investment funds, um, venture capitalists, angels, um, in the technology sector, I don't think any of them would call themselves IoT investment funds. They've, some of them have just got their heads around calling themselves cloud investment funds, um, which is still confusing enough to some of the target uh, investees. So... Um, I, I had a quick chat to a few of the investors in the build-up to this conference as to how much they're you know, actively monitoring, actively involved in the Internet of Things. And most of them are, you know, they badge themselves as business-to-business, -business, SaaS 
investors or you know, business to consumer SaaS investors. And yes, they have strategy sessions on the in, in Internet of Things and the impact on the market generally, but none of them were in any way inclined to start badging themselves as an Internet of Things investor. Um, now, it, we touched on, I think it was a question from over there in, in the last discussion in Ewan's piece about um, where the investment is going at the minute. And probably five years ago, we saw a lot of you know, your smart meter companies coming through um, quite a bit of active investment at that time. It's been a topsy-turvy market, as I'm sure one or two in the room will attest. Um, where we see most of the money going now from the private investors is, is away from the device-led side. So you'll get the big, you know, your big corporates coming in on the device side, your big six energy companies, your, your, your Microsofts and the like. But it's a small pot. There are only you know, a dozen um, large enterprises that you'll be able to sell the device side to. So a lot of the private investment now is focusing on the, the service side of things. So as, as the cost for devices inevitably will come down and down and down, um, you know, the, the value add will be in the service provided around those devices. So a lot of the investors are focusing very much on, on that side of things, specifically you know, the, the data management and analytics, um, cyber security, particularly in relation to financial technology. So fintech's booming um, you know, right across the world at the minute. There's a lot of competition. Israel are, are trying to build bridges with the, the UK financial technology market to try and develop that side of things. And, and in that discussion, in that broader uh, fintech discussion, we touch on Internet of Things um, and the way that they are gearing their investment strategy isn't so much based on the Internet of Things, but they are taking some of their earlier stage companies and those that are now much more geared up to, they're asking the questions that perhaps companies didn't ask five, six years ago as to, well, what am I doing with this data? How secure is it? How legal is it, to be honest? The number of companies we have coming up doing some kind of data scraping and analytics who just say, can we just touch on whether this is right, what I'm doing? And there, there, there isn't often an answer to that. It's, you know, it's such a, a shade of gray. And you know, we'll, we'll come on to the government, I suspect, in a minute. But um, you know, regulation will drive a lot of what happens in the Internet of Things. And so, but the, the investors are more looking at it from a perspective of the, the more mature, advanced companies at an earlier stage are, are asking the questions that perhaps those that are less attractive aren't asking as to how they, how they help you know, develop through that regulatory framework, which is yet to be developed. So, um, it, it's good to have that inquisitive mind. Um, but yeah, so having a panel of a real mixed background, the key focus will be on the Q&A. We've got some questions that I, I'll happily put to the panel, but hoping that you guys have some good questions as well. But if I hand over to Peter now to wrap things up. Thanks very much, and uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, firstly, thank you for welcoming me along today. It's been a very interesting debate so far. Uh, my, uh, can I just see a show of hands in terms of how many SMEs are in the room or how many academics who want to be at SMEs and how many people are actually going to go through this funding cycle, say, within the next, next six to 12 months? Okay. Yeah, a reasonable, reasonable handful. Well done and good luck. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, <laughs> I'm not terribly cynical, but I'm, I'm, healthily, uh, I'm a healthy cynic. I, 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 my, you can probably tell I'm not from here, I'm from Canada originally, but I've been in the UK 20 plus years, and 20 plus years um, pretty much I've either went from the big FTSE 100 city-based financial technology corporate into startups in, in 2000. And I've had a real roller coaster ever since, floated companies, um, had successful companies, had failures. One, in fact, I, I, I just closed down on the train on the way down here. So, you know, it goes up and down. and, and um, <laughs> I'm actually terribly, terribly relaxed about it because uh, I, I, I tend to be an undying, uh, you know, glass half full optimist. And, and you know, the one thing that I love about my job now is that I get to look at some really cool technology all the time. Uh, what I try and do is find little companies, um, sometimes do uh, angel investment in those companies, and then help those companies accelerate. And I can give you a few examples of that. Uh, my background really, 
bestrides um, a few few of the things we touched on here today. Uh, very much a security guy. One of the first companies I ever set up post, uh, well, I did a dot-com company, and that was amazing. We, we raised a quarter of a billion euros and, and even floated that business in, in Germany. So that, that all happened in about 18 months. That was pretty amazing. Um, but that company, of course, kind of didn't actually go bust, but, you know, drifted off, and I drifted off the other direction. Uh, but at the, since then, I've been doing startups. My first startup that did okay is an encryption software company, so that was a hard drive encryption company. Then I've gotten into a number of cybersecurity, uh, intellectual property licensing businesses. Um, I'm now an investor and advisor to a company called Digital Shadows, which is a cybersecurity intelligence platform and based in uh, level 39, uh, which is a, if you haven't been there, please go. It's a great uh, fintech innovation center right in the heart of uh, Canary Wharf in one Canada square. They've now branched out into level 42, which is a high growth floor there. Pleased to say Digital Shadows, when I met them, three people, now 25 people doing their B round. So they're, they're on their way. They're on the 42nd floor, amazing view uh, over the city of London. Interesting, last week there was a great event um, on Tuesday uh, hosted in, in Level 39 where two things happened. One is that Level 39, or the, the group that runs Level 39 on behalf of Canary Wharf, launched a Smart Cities um, Innovation Hub, which will be based on Level 28 in that building. They're also going to be, a, a, if you look at um, le Level 39, just Google that, uh, you'll find uh, that you, you as a small company can apply to six different streams. They're looking to get larger companies and then Microsoft, the Intel's and other speakers around this event are, are they're seeking sponsorship uh, to pull up yet another innovation hub in the smart city space. And, there, and you know, it's a great time to be doing internet of things type things. Um, I, I, I tend to like some, all the marketing hype that's coming down. I love it. The internet of everything. You know, it, it, I, I agree with um, you, and I, I don't think we'll call it the internet of things for long. For me, it's nothing new. Cloud computing's nothing new. It's been happening since then. Distributed computing platforms back to the 1950s. Sensing technology has been around pretty much forever. It's just, you know, a caveman, oh, you know, oh, the rock of my finger. That's sensing technology. Things are getting faster, better, and more efficient. There's a great question somebody asked about how we're going to make money in this. Uh, I think you know, it was touched on by my fellow panelists. Um, for me, it's less about picks and shovels, i.e. the sensor tech. I think that's going to be very, very cheap and, and, and fast. And, and um, it's more about the services and adding value. And also, of course, we come back to this data thing. This, and for me, it's all about metadata. Uh, another example of, of how this works in practicality uh, with a little company I'm working with right now, I'm delighted to say last week I became a board member and an investor of a company called Asset Mapping. Um, AssetMapping.com, great name. Does what it says on the tin, folks. Um, they have a, an, and you know, this really ties into Hypercat as well. If you people aren't aware of Hypercat, uh, please look up Hypercat and sign up to their newsletters and, and join that consortia. Hypercat is an open standards play. And for me, the success of small bit companies, and you know, it, it, it was well pointed out again by an audience member that, oh, hold on, you're just talking about big companies in this space. For me, I'm going to be a little bit um, disruptive here, because I like to be disruptive, and say big companies, great. They've got all the firepower and the marketing muscle and certainly the, the budgets, but they will need innovation. Uh, they're always looking for innovation. Most of them are very bad about how they actually interact uh, with SMEs, uh, but you know, they're learning and they're trying to get better, hence these innovation centers. Where we're going with this is that, you know, I don't think a city, in fact, we've seen it time and again, a city is not going to, you know, say, all right, let's stop everything we do, let's stop everything from our sewage treatment works to our traffic systems to our police fire, you know, first responders, and just stop and rebuild everything. Unless we're, we're you know, in the Middle East and we're building a brand new city in the desert. Then we can do that. We have no legacy systems. What happens now? There's thousands of legacy systems. How do you track information around that? One, you know, with asset mapping, we're talking to all sorts of different companies. Again, a t um, one man and their dog operation. The favorite sort of business for me to get involved with because I can see how disruptive their technology will be. And of course, it's not just them. There are other people in this space as well. So I don't just sit here, I'm just selling one company. But what I'm selling is the concept of what they're trying to do. What they're doing with HyperCAD which is an open standard between legacy systems. It means that anyone can join HyperCat, anyone can write to HyperCat. The clever thing about open standards plays, of course, is the super glue, i.e. the red hat type operations, you stick over the open, open standards baseline. But you get to a point where your device and platform and building management system and whatever system you have in your building, agnostic. And that's a big point I want to make today. I think if you have agnostic approaches to your IoT, 
plays, you'll be in a better position rather than saying, oh, I'm just smoking their particular, or eating their dog food, or eating someone else. I can't work with you because you don't have X, Y, Z. We can work with everyone because we can be platform independent. Also, the, a big service thing here is actually managing your assets, managing your estates. If you can walk into a bank or a hospital or a, you know, and any piece of public infrastructure, train station, airport, what have you, and of course there are people doing some of this now, some of it effectively, some of it frankly not very effectively. If you look at one bank I'm thinking of, they have 2,000 buildings in the UK. They've been subject to all sorts of mergers, acquisitions, disposals. They've inherited, if you talk to their building management company, these guys are pulling their hair out. They've got a service level agreement. They've got to try and uh, build a, a, a reasonable profit margin around. And they don't really know what's in their estate or what's good and what's bad within their estate. So they need a baseline case where you can actually convert all of the existing assets into some sort of asset class which you can track, which you can map, where you know what they are, you know the type of asset. Good example of this, cause and response. Air conditioning's down, what do we do now? We talk to a receptionist, he or she may call their building management people, they'll send around an engineer, that may happen quickly, it may not. That person may turn up, go, ooh, I don't have the right part. They may go away. It could take days to fix an asset. What we're talking about here is really putting a disruptive turn on this, is building something out that in real time, you'll have an alert, a cause and effect that can send the engineer, you'll know the part because that asset's been, been properly mapped, and, and also on the back of that, over a period of time, you'll be, you'll be able to build up metadata where you know if a particular asset or unit class is actually performing well or poorly. So when you're doing refresh and estate management, you can actually look at actually what has been good and what has been bad. So you've got a baseline class, you've also got an actionable intelligence. So for me, this is where you begin adding real value to this, and this is where you can build, begin writing a business model where you can say, and it's not just, you know, it's mapping the assets, it's capturing the assets. So doing, doing everything from saying, I'll come on your estate and take all your existing information and convert that to a, literally, a tablet-based system where an engineering uh, person can know exactly what's on that state and see live feeds in and get actual intelligence around the asset class, I think is cool. I'll give you one last example of this. Um, and, and you know, I, I haven't really talked about funding. I'm going to do that really quickly. But let me just talk about what we did with Intel last week. We built something, we, it was lots of super glue and you know, lots of pizza and late night beers for the engineering crew. What we did was actually build to their new Galileo platform, Moon Island, some of you would, would, may have heard about, certainly I'm, I'm, I'm sure the, uh, the Intel speaker can refer to this. Uh, but we actually, what we did was actually put a live building management system through, to, um, through this Moon Island chip into some software. So you can actually see real live stuff in the building and you know, hold a thermal sensor, see what happens. You know, so this is, for me, is where the future is going. It's all going to be joined up. Um, it, there's lots of room for little guys. Um, you, you need to be prepared to go through quite an arduous process sometimes working with larger companies, particularly if a bank or someone wants to buy your software directly. I'll speak very briefly about the UK. The UK is changing. I, I, I see the UK investment market, and I, and I do a lot of work here in the UK, um, as being development capital rather than risk capital. So if all you guys have some really whacked out idea that's going to totally disrupt the industry, get on a plane and go to San Francisco. Don't try and sell it here. It just won't work. But if you have a solid business model, as, as some of our panelists have done in the past, and actually can prove, you know, particularly in semiconductors, well done you. Uh, that's a hard market to raise money in. Uh, but it, it, you can show a development stream and that you've got a good credible team. Sure. There, I think there's a, a great angel with a tax advantage like, like me. Uh, the uh, enterprise investment scheme, seed in in enterprise investment schemes, uh, just nodding here. You know, if you make an investment, you basically get 50% of your money back from the tax man, plus a whole bunch of other benefits. It's a no-lose deal. The problem I see is not so much around the seed angel side, it's that real gap in the market where post-seed angel, what do people do? And there is a real funding gap there. Hence, um, the government stepping in uh, under the British Business Bank set up by Vince Cable and the coalition, uh, there's now 3.9 billion pounds they've gone under management for lots of regional schemes, national schemes. The big investment scheme that they've, they've uh, funded over the last couple of years, which is now having a huge effect on the UK venture market, is something called the Enterprise Capital Fund. And the Enterprise Capital Fund is for uh, accredited investors. Normally, uh, there's something like, I think, 13 funds in existence, more coming. Um, and so, if a, and current, uh, for example, off the top of my head, Passion Capital, Notion Capital, Amadeus, all have Enterprise Capital Funds. Um, the, the British Business Bank will match 
their new fund by two-thirds, i.e. two-thirds of the money is British taxpayers' money that's run very cleverly and, and, and on strong financial terms by the BBB that's then allocated to, to the investment fund. So the investment fund needs to go to you know, private, private individuals or pension funds, etc., that want to fund. But significantly what's changed, and this is good for the British UK market, is that the British Business Bank have raised... The, the limits on enterprise capital fund. So in the last four months, it's gone from a, a cap of 25 million of fund up to 50 million. Mm -hmm. And also, very significantly, it's also given the venture fund uh, the ability to uh, not just invest two million pounds in one deal, but to also invest up to five million pounds. So what this means for those people familiar with follow-ons is that you can, it, they can take part in an A round. They can also take part where, where they may, might put in, say, 50 to a million pounds. They also have you know, four million pounds or so in their back pocket where they can, if they choose to, they can follow on. Now this is significant because that fund takes off, that, that means the original investor can, can also support that through, through the next funding round, which is, which is very significant indeed. The last thing I'll say is about catapults. Um, the, following the good German uh, model, the Fraunhofer Institutes, if anyone's uh, aware with, of those, what the British government, again, through the, the TSB, Innovate UK now, um, have, have done is create so far seven, soon to be eight, uh, different vertical markets. Some of these were existent around you know, medical research or high value manufacturing uh, or space research. Some of them are new. Um, the new ones are, are, as you'd expect, around the digital economy, um, future cities as it's called, and the one that I'm involved with as, as an ambassador or advisor um, is, is called the uh, transport systems catapult. So don't think about transport, think about the systems element of that. Clearly, there's a lot of crossover around internet technology in all these areas. My role with that catapult has been advising them about looking at creating an investment fund uh, specifically to look at opportunities in this space. So unfortunately, I know too much about it. Happy to take any questions offline or over coffee or whatever, but thank you very much. Thank you. Right, so you've had a brief background from everyone there, some very interesting insight, picking up one of your points, acting for Notion Capital, as I do. Um, now is seen as a, is a good time for raising funds for certain investors in the right space. Um, the ECF and European Investment Fund as well are, are dishing out quite a bit of cash at the minute to uh, investors in the right space. So a number of investors are fundraising a minute, at the minute, looking to close funds in the next you know, 12 months. Um, so there is a, a good pipeline of funding coming through in the right kind of space for the audience in this room. So th there's, there's a lot to be excited about on that front. Um, it's, a lot of it's finding the right investor and the, the, you know, the right one for one company will be completely different for another company. Um, so what we'll do now is we'll move to the, the Q&A. Um, there are a c some questions that we've been already provided with, but um, if it, perhaps if we get one of those started, um, Simon, I suppose this might be one for you to pick up and, and perhaps chip in for Peter. The, you know, there's a lot of talk from the government at the minute about, um, I think David Cameron referred to it as the, the second industrial revolution being the Internet of Things, um, and I think over £70 million of committed funds now to Internet of Things. D do you see that kind of coming down to the, um, you know, the, the accelerator and visor hubs, or do you see much difference in terms of approach from, from the governmental side as opposed to just backing technology companies as they have been fairly good at over the years through tax breaks and, and certain grant schemes. This is where you really wish you had a delegate list to work out who's in the room. Every time David Cameron comes on to I just turn it off so I completely missed that, uh, <laughs> that, that announcement, but I'm sure it's very, very good um, in, indeed. I mean, I must say where we, we really focus with the, uh, with the, with the set scope of the incubators, what, what we do is that entrepreneurial leap forward to, to the seed funding. And, you know, we can go beyond that, but that's, that's where we really put um, our energy. And the, um, the waves of government schemes that, that come, come and go over, over the years you know, create a, a useful mood music. And you know, we, we, will, we will take for our clients, for our companies, money wherever it comes. And as I mentioned, the, the deck funding, we've had the, the INETs and uh, different, different, different schemes along the way. But none of that really messes with, uh, with, with fund fundamentals that I think Peter uh, described very eloquently. For this, this, this sort of first step, you need to demonstrate to, um, to people who are customers who, who have paid or are likely to pay for your, for your product the, um, 
extreme value of it against the risk of you know doing doing nothing, and that um, I think that's that's most important. Therefore, um, the the tax breaks, particularly at the seed level, that's 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 what's made a difference yeah. on the ground over, over over many years. And that's I don't really mean to criticise the work of Innovate UK and these these big um, government now. So I do get a little bit confused whether the money is being recycled and it's the same money or different money. Uh, it's, it's great to have those announcements because it, it creates uh, belief. We all believe, we in Bath here in Bristol, we believe in the tech center, a sector, we believe in what we're doing, we believe in enterprise and innovation, that's, that's really good. What makes a difference to my clients, the entrepreneurs in the, in the centers, month by month, quarter by quarter, is really those, those, those tax incentives that allow people, business angels, to believe they know what they're doing, to take risks on Entrepreneurs who also believe what they're doing, and if you get enough belief, you know we do get great companies. That, that's what comes forward. So I am optimistic, and you know I'm, we love the government. Really, we do. Thanks. Uh, uh, so pass this to Peter. Peter, do you have a similar experience from, with your TSB hat on? Um, well, uh, yeah. And to be fair, I don't wear a TSB hat. I, uh, <laughs> the, um, uh, I have done work, uh, quite a bit of work with TSB. Indeed, I've been involved in a number of companies who have been lucky enough to to secure. Uh, TSB grant funding through through different programs, and I generally think it's a good thing. Uh, it, it, the, in, in fact, you know, it de-risks any investment from an angel perspective or a venture capital perspective. But, and my big but here is that it is, and pardon my French, but uh, they are a bugger to administer. You know, anyone in the room who's had any grant funding from those organizations, you know, I know great, really smart entrepreneurs who maybe don't have the greatest eye for detail, probably including myself. And you, know, it, it, you can throw yourself off a cliff before you, you can. And also, I don't think they enable all the, all the you know, it's a whole thing. You've got to spend the money before you can claim the money. If you don't have the cash flow to spend the money, how can you claim the money? I don't know. You know and, this, and they call this an innovation fund. I see some nodding heads the, who, who have experienced my pain. Um, they, and also, there's just some administration things. And it's not a critique by any means. You know, we're extremely lucky in this country. I, I, I also live in Edinburgh, and I can, I can bore you rigid about the whole Scottish enterprise side of things, which actually is quite different to how it is down south. But there is a lot of, call it soft money, but you have to work hard to get the soft money. But soft money defers um, any, any venture risk. What I don't like, however, is that there's been, a, a, particularly in, in this space, Hypercat Consortia won 1.6 million pounds of funding. Hurrah. However, TSB was out of money, so they had to delay that funding until next April. Well, that means in reality, a number of sm really smart SMEs I know who are desperate for cash can't begin submitting invoices till next July. So n not, not too clever there. But um, things are changing, and I think changing for the better. Uh, thanks. Okay. Thank you. And Peter, from the, uh, from, from the company side, what's your experience? Yeah, well, we currently um, have a TSB grant that um, we're in the middle of a project, and our experience is exactly the same as that. Um, <laughs> so that's saying that it is valuable. I mean, I, I, I like it. I find um, I get really irritated by special offers, you know, like um, three for the price of two. Because I go in there and I think, I only want one. Um, so rather than having a beneficial effect on me, I've, I've now felt I've been ripped off because my one is somehow costing me more. And someone advised me, they said, ignore special offers. If what you want happens to be in special offer, it's a bonus, but don't kind of go for them. And I think it's the same with, um, you know, with government funding. There, yeah, You can't base what you want to do around that, but if it happens to be there, then that's, that's, a, that's a good bonus. And I, I, I agree with uh, Simon, actually, that the really good things are the, uh, the money from government that enables people to do what's right for business, business the um, uh, EIS money in that, and of course um, the R&D tax credit, which has been going for uh, about a dozen years now, and that is really good. You do the R&D that you need to do for your business purposes, and the government gives you a rebate on that, which is excellent. We should, with the R&D tax credits, we should give them an award for running a scheme and not changing its name for so long because it's been so <laughs> successful, hasn't it? Yeah. It's got to be a British first. I, uh, <laughs> we should be very, very proud of that one. Yes. Um, I just, well, so the, the, you were saying, Pete, uh, Peter, about the, the fintech um, incubators being, being put in Canary Wharf. I, I think that, that, that's, that's fantastic. Um, I think uh, you know, one of the secrets to, to financing, to funding your internet of things or your fintech idea is actually putting it close to customers. That's bloody obvious, isn't it, really? But, um, but, but 
creating those, those pressure cookers, those, 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 those environments where it's easy to meet lots and lots of customers. So this, is, this, is, this is a little bit of a, uh, a move, isn't it? We had the kind of lean startup moves and minimum viable product and yeah, just talking to lots and lots of customers. I think it was the backlash to um, over protectivism, over intellectual property. So, you know, very, very good. I think um, you know, one thing that one could do for one's internet of product, uh, internet of uh, 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 internet of things product would be to ensure that you're embedded in an environment where you're meeting lots of people who are likely to use the, the end product, the, the, the services and so on. We, we, we run a, a set square, a program, the Open Innovation Program, which is a fancy name for helping our members to meet corporates who um, are looking for, for new technology solutions from, from, from small, small companies, Barclays, Bank, CGE, uh, Freescale, and they all, they all want Internet of Things. They might not call it Internet of Things, but they, you know, they want solutions to their problems. And immersing yourself in that, I think, is, is, is as good as anything else going to, you know, to the, the government grants and, and so on. Thank you. Right, we've done one question here. <laughs> Can I open it up to the floor and ask, uh, ask you to invite very early with the hand there? Do you want to? <laughs> uh, Adam Reynolds from Shawsense. Um, talking about Hypercat and the value of manufacturing of IoT devices, the value that some of the manufacturers apply is by offering services on top for the collection of data. So how do you see where Hypercat comes in? Because that destroys the value, if that makes sense? Yeah. Uh, good question. Oh, thanks very much. That's a good question. I, I think you know hyper, hypercat is just another standard, and and the, there's I think the real difference here is that it, it's it is at least uh, in its early incarnation. Uh, and to be uh, you know again we we might have a little bit of a criticism against the technology strategy board there, but I know the guy who actually was the father of hypercat, and that was a technology strategy board innovation thing where, where he put a group of people you know, in a collective room and gave them enough money for three months and they made this thing happen. And so I think, I'm, I'm full of admiration for that, by the way, I think it's great. And it's really gonna help Britain PLC. But to your question, I, th I just see it as another standard and everyone's gonna be promoting lots of different standards. And I think people will have to, at least in the early stage, kind of pick whichever standard they can write to or work to. And you know, like we have with asset mapping, asset mapping, we've adopted Hypercat. Um, we, what we're seeing is a number of big companies swirling around the Hypercat. Uh, if you look on their website, you'll see lots of big brand names. Some people are missing, by the way, but some of the missing people we're talking to as well, that some of the obvious people, oh, why aren't they there? And I won't mention them because they're pretty obvious when you look at the website. And people are going, well, may, we, we've got our own standard that if you want to sell to us, you have to write to ours. And I'm thinking, well, that's great, but it, it's kind of a real risk for us because we don't have any resources yada, yada, yada. So when we're big and we're, we're, we can be a multi-standard play, but it, it, it comes back to this point I was making earlier about trying to be agnostic. And I think the open standard really leads to that. And I really like that. And also, if you really play the open standard game well, you're contributing to that standard. You're not just using that yourself and then building something really clever. You can contribute somewhat to that standard and still retain a value proposition for your company. Yeah. I mean, you look at who, who we're talking about here and those who've stolen an early march um, will inevitably be um, contrary to what, what, what Hypercat's trying to achieve in that uh, you know, it detracts from some of the value of the companies who've invested a lot already in trying to do exactly what Hypercat is then trying to open up for anyone to do. Um, so, but at, at the same time, a lot of the companies coming through will be looking to adopt Hypercat in, in particular and, and, and other forms. Um, so it's something that will become more prevalent. The early movers probably are already at a place in their market strategy in terms of their exit strategy, perhaps, where you know, they don't need to embrace it as much. Um, but perhaps when, when it's moved over, when you've, when you've gone through the exit and you've actually sold your product company, um, then, then you know, the, the buyer may look to adopt it in, in more uh, open terms. But um, we were having this conversation earlier about uh, in, in, about that protectionism versus the openness, which is you know, the root of a lot of the problems of Internet, Internet of Things and the, the Huawei trying to turn Cambridge into the IoT hub of, of, of the country and putting a lot of money into trying to make Cambridge the, the home of all things IoT, which is in itself contrary to what a lot of the, the Internet of Things companies are trying to achieve into you know, the, the Berners-Lee model of, of opening everything up in order to make the country 
IoT specialist, so it's going to be an in interesting landscape over the next couple of years, certainly. I, don't know. I mean, the communication point's uh, an interesting one for you, I suppose. Yes, I, mean, I, I thought um, Hypercat is a way of people discovering where stuff is. It's not, um, I mean, it's in, in essence, it could be a sales tool to sell what you've got. It's not saying that it's, um, just because something is open doesn't mean it's free. Um, so, um, I mean, I think everyone always uses the example of temperature. Um, maybe there's not that much interesting IoT data out there, but that using that example, if you want to find temperatures, um, you know, you can use Hypercat to go around and discover who's got temperatures of, um, you know, of um, office buildings in Bath or something. But having done that, it enables you to easily access that. But there may be, there's nothing to say that someone's not going to charge you for that. So I, 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 I don't see that it's, it's um, I, don't, I don't see that opening stuff and making it available um, is synonymous with meaning it's free. Yeah. Do you have anything to add on that one, Simon? Do you have any other questions from the floor? Otherwise, I will revert to... Oh, we've got one. Go for it. That's a Greg Smart, 500 more. Um, I wonder if the panel could comment on the role of uh, crowdfunding for IoT. Um, from, from my perspective, um, we... The, the, as you are no doubt aware, the, the number of crowdfunders have exploded phenomenally. Um, we were involved in um, Crowdcube uh, when they first set up, um, at which point it was you know, a fairly groundbreaking uh, enterprise for the UK, at least. Since then, you know, you've got a lot. I know um, Tim works with Cedars a bit, and, and there are, we're seeing a, a lot of different models coming through the market. The, the question that always comes up when you have conversations about crowdfunding. Uh, yes, it's great accessibility and it, to cash now. It, 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 to companies who might not be able to uh, otherwise get funding um, in that, particularly in that gap, perhaps early angel stage, uh, it, gives, it gives access to funding they might otherwise not have. Um, the, the exit model is, is as yet relatively unproven, and that, that puts off a number of companies in terms of if they can get their cash elsewhere. A lot of them are still tending to stray away from crowdfunding, um, but it, it, within the Internet of Things, it would presumably have to be a more kind of consumer-facing product uh, that, that goes to crowdfunding, because if you're trying to get crowdfunding for some complex algorithms that you apply to data management, you'll have your crowdfunders scratching their head and, and not funding it ultimately. So a lot, a lot will depend on what it is you're doing. If they think it's a clever widget, if Nest had gone for crowdfunding, people might have got that. Um, but a lot of the more complex things may struggle. I don't know if you're seeing a similar experience through Set Squared. Um, I won't comment on the whole of Set Squared, but in the Bath Set Squared Centre, we haven't, we haven't crowdfunded um, uh, a business um, uh, so far. Um, but you, you would think the Internet of Things would be a really great candidate for, for, uh, for crowdfunding because it's, um, it's got the wave of, of publicity euphoria around it, the, the, the numbers that you had shared with us. Um, you know, it's a great way of presenting the, the, the trillions and billions of devices and dollars that, uh, you know, conspiracy of IDC, Cisco and Gartner are, are, are cooking up. That's, if you've got that behind you, um, it, it's, good, it's good for the crowd. The, I, I, I guess what, particularly for wearables and so forth, what was coming through later, I think, in this conversation is, uh, you know, the uh, perhaps inevitable destiny for the Internet of Things to be uh, business to business enterprise, you know, quite uh, you know, driven for utilities, asset tracking, uh, doesn't strike me as um, being so pro for the uh, for, 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 for crowdfunding. Uh, I might rely on more kind of traditional uh, sources, but yeah, reality will, will will come through in good time. But I think it's an excellent place to begin. Did see have been getting to see some other kind of crowd uh, funding platforms that are um, kind of counterintuitively closed crowd funding platforms. So sort of invited invited crowds or you know semi walled garden. <laughs> so those plays are coming out, and they they get they get quite interesting because the 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 um, uh, exclusive crowd will have uh, the one we're looking at is for. Um, deep IP businesses, which, as you'd expect, coming from a university is kind of interesting uh, for us. And that you, you might see in time um, 
kind of restricted crowd platforms that are around Internet of uh, Things and, and so on. But, uh, yeah, we'll see. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of in the, the, things, the things that get crowdfunded in the Internet of Things. Um, and there's a, you know, there's a problem with those. I was at an Internet of Things conference last week, and someone gave an example of um, it was a thing that had been funded on Kickstarter or something. It was basically something you stick in the um, audio jack of your phone, which is actually a button that you can press to do something. Um, and this got funded on Kickstarter, and, it, and they were charging like something like $25, $30 for each of the, all these people who contributed. Um, and then, of course, someone in China gets the idea, and they start selling the same thing for $3. And apparently, some time later, someone else had an idea of how they could give these things away for free and link it to an app that um, then got some advertising revenue somehow. So it, was, it didn't really get that company any further along. I mean, the other thing is, when you do that sort of crowdfunding, is you get the money up front. It pays for your manufacture of the, the, how many things you're making for the, for the funders. But then you go to the next thing and you realize, oh, I haven't got any working capital. I can't, I can't make any more. So it doesn't really make a lot of sense to the people getting the funding. Um, so it is kind of those, those sort of fun things, really. And I'm not quite sure if I would get the e equity ones either, because, um, well, I mean, obviously people are doing it, but you, I wouldn't invest in something like that. You're investing in a sort of seed round or something that you've got no control over what happens to it. And, um, well, I, I just don't really want something to understand from the company not spending your money and then walking off and doing something else. But... Um, but so I'm, yeah. I we're, we're not in continuing bridge. We're not really considering crowdfunding as an option of what we're doing, um, anyway, for for those sorts of reasons. Yeah, I think the, uh, your questions reminded me that I bought something on a crowdfunding site and it hasn't arrived yet. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, so I, I, I think crowdfunding, at least initially, of course, was about cool things, about you know price uh, disintermediation around devices. We've already spoken about. Um, I think the crowdfunding market is changing a lot as well. Of course, it's always going to be your Kickstarter uh, business to consumer. Uh, type thing, which I think is great in terms of uh, discovering and helping little companies. I really like the Neil Young Pono um, crowd Kickstarter campaign. He, he raised about seven million bucks for his, you know, high quality audio device. You know, that's the sort of thing I'm, I'm into. Uh, but I also think professionally the market's changing. I think for for me, uh, a, a lot of the investment market around the Internet of Things is about, and for any investment of, of new tech, it will soon be more about platform discovery and a wider briefing discovery for interested parties. So I see a, an environment, and indeed I've got a friend who's working on, on a, a, a model like this, where you're aggregating professional inve investment interests. It's more a VC to crowdfunding professional platform where you do have accredited investors who, like any, any traditional investment round right now, if Notion Capital goes in, they could ring out their buddy at Passion or Octopus or whoever and go, hey, we're, in for, we're, we're gonna be the lead, we're going to take 50%. You guys want 20 I know, the, I know you guys all that. They do this all the time. So th this is what will happen in, in that type of model. You'll have accredited players that have probably been pre-checked. Pre you may have high net worth in, in there where you can self-declare right now as high net worth if you want to do a SEIVS investment. So I see that p it, it becoming a professionalized market. But, you know, an IoT play where you're talking about, you know, some, some disruptive technology, I don't think it's for your, your average Kickstarter investor. Yeah. I mean, crowdfunding itself has always existed, you know, even at the angel level. I'm sure when you've invested, you've got buddies you call up and say they've got this great company. And, um, you know, locally there are some good networks. There, there are the formal ones, um, but equally there are as many, um, if not more successful informal ones, where they are a group of high net or ultra high net individuals who go around together investing in things. And together they know they've got the pockets to onward fund. They've got the contacts with institutional investors. So giving those kind of investment models more of a platform where perhaps the, those, those groups of experienced investors can tie together, like you're talking about, is, is probably where the more successful crowdfunders will go in future. Um, but in terms of giving access to early stage cash on the consumer level, I think you know, the Kickstarter model, which then spread into the UK, will be around for a long time. And um, whether or not there are many people here who... Uh, who will be able to make use of it is another thing. 
thinking when you're talking about crowdfunding, another uh, area that I think is much more uh, relevant to the Internet of Things is almost small crowd um, development. Uh, you, you know, Internet of Things and everything that goes with that, that kind of big data and the cloud, it, it's got great potential, very disruptive potential. And I, I think you and you use the, the, the uh, reference, the case study that's, that's been talked about quite a lot about the, the BMW car driving along, going over a, a pothole, that the sensors picking that up, that data being captured and put over to their great big data center in, in, in Germany. And, and how, where's, where's the utility of, of that information? Is it for the driver, to, for, the, for the, the service history of the vehicle? Could that data be sold to local authorities to help them prioritize road fixing? So, uh, and you, you see this kind of crowd development or small group development of Internet of Things applications um, coming, coming through. We're, just to, about to launch into some work with the National Health Service in the south of England, and they're very interested in getting groups of, of people together, experts, so developers with clinicians, uh, practitioners, managers, and so forth, to, to see how they could uh, explore ideas of Internet of Things, cloud technology to, to solve the kind of the, the problems that, that snake their way through um, the different sectors, the different silos within any large organization. Right, it's not the same as crowdfunding, but frankly, if you, you bring together non-obvious um, beneficiaries of an Internet of Things application, finding the money wouldn't be too difficult. I mean, you know, Innovate UK, Angels and so forth, where you, where you can see obvious utility, great value return, uh, the, the, the money's going to follow. So I think that uh, you know, crowd development might be a, a great way forward for Internet of Things plays. I say that NHS uh, uh, organisation is more successful than the information authority was. <laughs> uh, um, any, any more questions from the floor? Feel free to raise your hand, otherwise I will pick up some of the questions that have been put to us before here. Um, some of them which are unanswerable, but we'll give it a go, I'm sure. <laughs> I feel like being very cruel on one of my fellow panel, panel members here. Um, <laughs> okay, well, Simon, you've asked for it. <laughs> so, um, one of the questions that came through it relates to the, uh, the figures attached to revenue within the broad Internet of Things sector and uh, how much it will generate over the next decade. So, you know, it's, it's a very pertinent question for a lot of the people in the room, I'm sure, as to, as to how you kind of value the market, how you value your company looking forward into an as yet unproven sector and the internet of things and um, you know you, you see any different big tech company comes up with its own prediction ranging from millions to billions to trillions and the numbers are you know it's finger in the wind territory. Um, when you're helping ad advise your companies in the accelerator program you know how do you give them a steer as to, you know, we, we see within the fintech market, for example, you see some, you know, dot-com bubble type valuation thing put on it. You know, you, well, there's a worldwide market for e-invoicing e um, that's worth several trillion. We're front runners, so we've got a value, let's say a billion, even though we're not selling anything at this point. And you're seeing some absolutely ludicrous valuations at the minute, which on one hand, very good, but on the other hand, as an investor, <laughs> it's a gamble. So, um, but, but it, within the internet of things, kind of marketplace, how do, how do you manage that? Because I'm sure you're asked this question a lot. No, I think, I mean, you, you, and you, you illustrate the, the, the contradiction very well. I mean, uh, um, the, the hyperbole, the, the boom is, is not against our interests mm -hmm. at all. And I think the example of Exylon where, you know, they're, they're, funding, they're funding an opportunity, um, they're, they're, doing, they're doing great at that, and they're great entrepreneurs, you know, serious, experienced entrepreneurs, they got great experience in their technology, but yeah, what moved it was, thank goodness, the Internet of Things came along because the smart meter market didn't move. Yeah. Same entrepreneurs, same technology. I mean, things moved on a little bit, but that's so that was that was in their uh, was to their to their advantage. Um, and there is there is a reality check. I know that um, last week, uh, Nick Sturge, who's the director of the Sesquare Centre in Bristol, and I were were in Bristol talking to a chief marketing officer of a you know, big stock exchange listed uh, electronics company talking about the Internet of Things numbers, talking about the, you know, the, the Cisco Gartner IDC yeah. numbers. And I mean, 
their estimates of devices shipped are, you know, hundreds, hundreds of millions, not, you know, by the, the, the far off millions, Wizard of Oz, yeah. end of the yellow brick road, five years time. So massive, massive discrepancies here. So long uh, gets the point, which is what do we do with the companies? Well, we, we need them to, to be, our clients to be, to be plausible, to be credible to investors as they navigate through this hyperlit. So they need to have a point of view on it, but, uh, and, and to be part of, of the success that we all expect to come from the Internet of Things. But away from the conference platforms, away from the PR, when they're in a room, when they're negotiating term sheets with investors, the business plan will need to be bottom up. They'll need to be referencing customers who can be uh, interviewed and, and give, uh, give the correct answers to do due diligence. So um, clearly, reality does kick in. Um, I'm not, nothing wrong with the hyperbola. Yeah. Peter, I'm sure this is a question you face a few times. Yes, I mean, I, I, I think you should always have a business plan and you should change it regularly um, because I mean, you, you've got to go have a, and I agree with the bottom up. You can say, oh, we've got some customers um, now. Um, you know, if we added up all our installations at the moment, we'd probably, where we deployed stuff, it's less than 100. But, um, so somehow you can extrapolate from, from that and what people are saying and what they're going to, what they, the, what they want to deploy and then match that up with you know, what comes down from uh, top down. But, I mean, there's kind of six billion mobile phones in the world, aren't there? So um, you know, you, you've got to have more than a few, hundred, <laughs> a few hundred thousand things deployed as well within the next few years. I mean, we, I think we already have, haven't we? Um, so the, the, I think the, the, the 20 billion numbers the, the, actually now doesn't look very um, that high. Uh, so I think people are, we are, everyone is accepting. Um, and as Ewan said earlier on, it's not like all these things are going to be individually connected to the internet. Um, you know, even you, the mouse in your computer is kind of part of the internet of things, but um, it's, it, it's, um, but it's not directly connected. Um, that, um, so I think those numbers, they're, they're, they, they, they do somehow make, they do kind of make sense. Um, and you just reference them, that's a great thing. You're an analyst, you produce a report and people will reference it and they're all similar sorts of numbers. So you can therefore say, because we're doing this, the, ov the overall market is going to do this, therefore we're going to have this valuation, which is um, what you need to do. And if it changes, I mean, like that uh, Xylon is a great example because you know, they're doing the same thing and they can then point to something else, growing market. Nest the value on that market. Yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd look at things from a practical perspective. I'm, I'm one of the guys that looks at the first business plan that somebody's ever written and going, oh my God, how many billion? You know, and, and you know, it, it's kind of like, well, that, well all I did, and I, I like to understand people's thinking about how they construct business plans. Because for me, that's the most important thing. Because they may have a perspective uh, which is actually a real world uh, perspective from experience they have from dealing with their customer base or their application of their technology. And so you have to actually look at, look at how this thing could actually event, i.e. how could this thing become a product? And of course, then who will buy it and at what price? And that's how I really start this whole business plan thought process. And so, under, and you know, oftentimes I meet people that have a much deeper knowledge of their marketplace than I do, otherwise I'm not interested in talking to them. And so it really is getting to a point where there's a, a proper world conversation about what the, is their value proposition, of course, what is their USP, but also, you know, what's it worth to people? And so, you know, and there's, there's a very interesting opportunity, I think, for lots of Internet of Things companies, by the way, if they partner with the big firms, like, like you know, the Microsofts and Intels and Cisco's, um, IBM's, etc. Because, and also, don't, don't forget about talking consultancy firms as well. Every one of the big four is trying to figure out how, how they're putting their heads around this thing. Every one of the big four, I met two, two firms last week, are also looking to put investment firms together. And again, they've never done investment firms, at least, you know, most of those, their partners haven't. So there's a lot of learning going on here. But I, I, so, you know, in terms of, so, if somebody ever asks you for a five-year detailed business plan, I say, look, I'm not going to waste my time doing that. And I'll give you what my best guess on a three-year plan, and what I'm going to show you for the first six to 12 months is the most real stuff that we can actually get. A lot of that's around what really, again, how, how, what our product is, how we sell it, who are the target markets, and also, of course, who are the people that we can already see or have identified to hire into that organization to fulfill key roles. You know, who's our head of development? Who, is, can, is this lady available as our commercial director? You know, 
know, who, who, who is our, our beginning team in, sorry, I'm buzzing. Um, who's our beginning team in, the, in this thing? So, you know, that, that's really where I think you should start from, rather than how big is the world? I, I remember Internet 1.01, that was great fun, I loved it. You know, the, how big is the world? Let's, oh, there's 7 billion people, everyone's going to want it, come on. And, uh, come on. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, guys. So thanks for that, guys. Lots to take in there, but I'm sure there's a chance for you all to connect to more directly and discuss further in our network session at 6 o'clock tonight. And also at the expert panel session, Chris will be sitting in on that, but I'm sure these guys will be around to call upon if necessary as well. Um, in the meantime, we're going to take a short refreshment break, so please enjoy the delights of Boston Tea Party down that little alcove in the corner there. Uh, please have a quick drink so we can aim to restart with the next session starting at 3.15, please.